All right, well, hello and welcome. Um, so tonight, I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about Buddhist cosmology. And part of the reasoning behind that is uh, we had a question and answer period maybe a couple of months ago now, and one of our Sangha members was asking about um, you know, what Buddhism thinks about ideas like the Big Bang or these sorts of explanations that we have of the origins of the universe or the solar system or galaxies, basically the origins of any of the stuff that's in space. And that was my mistake. So first, uh, by way of introduction, I would like to mention that it was Buddha's birthday on Monday, which is uh, very special this year because there was also an eclipse on the same day. Many people thought the world was coming to an end, but those of us who follow the Buddhist cosmology know that it isn't. <laughs> so, as the story goes, um, when the Buddha was born, he allegedly took seven steps in each of the cardinal directions as an infant and pointed at the sky and pointed down below him, and he said, I alone am honored on heaven and earth. And then he began his life as a normal baby from there on. <laughs> now that's not typically the kind of origin story that you would have heard from Shakyamuni Buddha probably about himself or where he came from. This is the sort of hagiography that came up, you know, to later generations to really sort of mythologize how important his birth was for the legacy that he started. And similarly, um, the Buddha himself was not very interested in cosmological speculation. And one of the more famous things that he's known for is what are called the unanswerable questions. And depending on what text you look at, there are different numbers of unanswerable questions. But they sort of revolve around the same ideas. Where did the world come from? Is the world infinite? If it's going to end, how's it going to end? Etc. Where do human beings come from? All these kinds of questions. And his response was pretty pragmatic. He said, well, I'm not going to answer these questions because what I'm here to do is try to teach people about dukkha, suffering or dissatisfaction, and how to relieve that. So from his perspective, this wasn't really uh, an immediate concern. But we know how people are. And Buddhists spent a lot of time trying to explain where the world came from, where the various things in space come from, the sun, the moon, the stars, other planets, etc. So this, for me, is at least kind of a fun topic, and it's not something that I know a ton about. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's mainly because of a Sangha member's question that I got interested in trying to sort of try and learn a little bit more about what the Buddhist tradition said. And one of the major sources that I use is this book that's in the picture. I also have a copy of here called Science and Philosophy in the Indian Buddhist Classics. And this is volume one, The Physical World. There are many more volumes. And what it is, is um, it, was, it, was, it was conceived by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and then basically written by a committee, edited, then translated into English by Ian Coughlin. So what this tries to do is kind of give survey knowledge about various topics uh, by the volumes. So like one of these is the physical world. There's another one about the historical schools of Buddhism, etc. So most of the sources that he's actually using are <coughs> well-known Buddhist exegetes, people like uh, Asanga, who was a major figure in Buddhism, uh, Vasubandhu, Dharmakirti, all these people who are very big names in Buddhist commentary and philosophy. Uh, in, in early Buddhism? Yes. Yeah. Specifically, we're talking about Indian Buddhism. And I wanted to kind of cut it off there because that gives us something that's still unwieldy, but we can at least do an overview of that. <laughs> so, that's the introduction to that, which you now know about. So, I think one of the things that's sort of interesting right off the bat is that. There are several critiques of notions of creationism, of some sort of being that could have created the world and all of the people in it. And one of the more famous ones comes from Dharmakirti, who is one of these uh, exegetes that I was mentioning. And Dharmakirti wrote a lot. Uh, he was mostly active during the 6th or 7th century. And really all of these rejections boil down to 
one key fact, which is that the notion of dependent origination is central to the Buddhist teachings. And for those who aren't super familiar with what dependent origination is, instead of thinking about cause and effect in terms of there's just a cause and then an effect comes from that, in Buddhism it's a little bit more complicated. So there has to be a cause that's acting within a set of already present conditions. And one of the examples that's a pretty famous one is, say you were to plant a seed. Well, if you just have the seed, it's very unlikely that it's going to sprout and grow into something. So the seed itself isn't the cause of the plant that happens later. It's the seed in combination with things like sunlight, water, soil, etc., that causes the plant to eventually grow. So in that sense, just saying that the seed causes the plant is not really accurate because you need all of these other things to actually make that happen. So basically, a lot of, uh, a lot of these early Buddhists took that idea and then applied it to questions about where the world would come from. And so in that case, for them, it's almost a foregone conclusion that there can't be some sort of intelligence that created the universe because that would be something that didn't arise dependently. So it's immediately contradictory to this core doctrinal belief. Well, that doesn't mean that other people didn't believe in creationism. So Dharmakirti, for instance, actually wrote critiques against this sort of theistic idea about how the world came to be. In his exposition of valid cognition, he brings up two sort of main objections. <laughs> so if you say that there's a creator, the first question that comes up for him is, well, then who created that creator? So he doesn't really see it as very compelling from that angle, because if, the, if this creator has some level of impermanence, then that creator must have come from some other creator. And then you just get an endless sequence of creators, and it doesn't really help you understand any better. But if you don't assume that this is the case, and you say instead that, well, the creator is always there, and then creates everything else. For Dharmakirti, this also results in a contradiction. And this might not be like immediately apparent, just from me saying it, but the idea that was a deeply held belief is that if something is a permanent entity in some way, it's incapable of affecting other things because of dependent origination. So for it to be permanent and unchanging, it can't be an interaction with anything else. It can't be interdependent. So the thinking here is that if there were a creator who uh, preceded everything that exists and is a permanent entity, then that creator wouldn't be capable of creating a universe in the first place because the things that are in the world, sentient beings, etc., are all impermanent and arise dependently. It might not be super apparent, but that's at least the way that they approached it. But all this is to say that Buddhist sources ended up converging on an intuition that because of dependent origination, there was likely no discernible beginning to the universe. So in other words, they just take this idea that things are already there and already happening. So instead, they did talk a lot about the formation of what we'll call world systems and this is a little bit different than our notion of the solar system or the Earth, you know, as we currently understand it, but we'll talk about that more in a moment. And what they posited was that there was a never-ending cycle of world systems that were coming into being and ending over and over and over again, and that this was uh, characterized by a four-part world cycle of the formation of a world, that world abiding for some amount of time, the destruction of that world, and then the reduction of it to essentially empty space. So this is uh, Vasubandhu. Um, this is actually a Japanese representation of him in a mm. sculpture. And uh, Vasubandhu and his half-brother Asango were both very influential Buddhist exegetes, and they were also both associated with the Indian um, institution Nalanda, which was uh, essentially an ancient university. And so uh, Dharmakirti, I believe, was also associated with it at some point, but it was a very central hub for a lot of the sort of 
more academic side of Buddhist inquiry. And a lot of really influential texts came out of that, out of that group. So Asanga and Vasubandhu uh, agreed on a set of what they considered to be the three conditions for the dependent origination of things. So just to follow this a little bit more. So the first condition for dependent origination that they identified was the condition of the absence of a prior design. And it's pretty self-explanatory what that means. They're saying that for things to arise dependently, it can't be something that is essentially created by the design of something outside of things that are dependently arisen. So there can't be a creator who's making things happen or it didn't arise dependently. The second criteria was the condition of impermanence. And this is what I was talking about briefly before. They believed that permanent things were incapable of acting on impermanent things because for an impermanent thing to act on a permanent thing in the first place, the permanent thing could by definition not be permanent because it's changed by things outside of itself. So for them, this was kind of a foregone conclusion that impermanence was another central condition for dependent origination. And then the third was the condition of potentiality. So going back to our seed example, or uh, let's, we'll talk about planting things, but let's say you planted some potatoes, right? You expect that you're going to get potatoes. This is basically an illustration of the condition of potentiality. There has to be some core of the result that you get within the cause that causes that effect to come into being. So a violation of this would be if you planted potatoes and watermelons grew out of it, for instance, which is sort of incoherent. And they saw this as actually being a extremely important part of the structure of reality because it applies to everything uh, from the sort of karmic theory of morality, where the consequences of our actions are something that we face, you know, later down the road, uh, to even things like, you know, agriculture, for instance. It seemed like it was something that was a very obvious, um, very obvious sort of almost axiomatic stipulation that they observed. So all of these things would have to be satisfied, according to Asanga and Vasubandhu, for us to have a good account of where all of these things come from. <clears throat> well, you're probably curious what the formation of the world would look like <laughs> using these conditions. And I think this is actually uh, fairly interesting. Um, don't worry about the tiny text on it. It's not super important because I'm going to explain it. So everything in the picture, this is, by the way, this is a world system. So this is what you're living on right now, at least according to, you know, ideas in the fourth, fifth, sixth century. And there's a series of disks at the bottom. And then things kind of build up in layers, and then at the top we kind of have this projection that comes up and sort of goes off into the sky somewhere. So the account from, uh, at least from Vasubandhu, of how this, how this formation happens is that, and we'll ignore <coughs> two of these disks right now, um, they're for a competing model, but the idea was that first there are some sort of particles that are out in space. And they're predominantly made of wind, but they also contain all of the other elements. And so this wind starts to sort of gather and coalesce. And as it does, it starts swirling. Now you're probably wondering why did the wind start moving in the first place? Well, the answer is it was the actions of sentient beings that cause it to happen. Because that's not a problem since the universe doesn't have a beginning we already always have sentient beings doing something somewhere. So it's our actions that start this wind stirring, right? It's the beginning of the next world system. And then once this wind really starts churning, all of these other elements are already inside it. And so a layer of clouds starts to form above it and rain comes down from those clouds and it forms the second disc, which in this picture, the fire disc is in between, but we'll skip to the water disc for now. And so there's a mandala of wind, and then there's a mandala of water on top of it. And that water starts getting churned, and as it does, the pieces of earth that are in the sort of particles start to coalesce together, 
And what they do is they start to basically create their own large disk. Now the rain is still falling from the clouds above, and from this disk, projections start to come up. So there are a series of mountain ranges in a circle that are in a great ocean, and then at the center is Mount Meru, or Sumeru, which is the axis of the center of the world. So everything is rotating around that, and it's the highest point. Interestingly enough, in the Abhidharma accounting, it's actually a four-sided pyramid. Um, but this is, uh, this is more like the Kala Chakra model, where it's actually rounded. And then we can sort of see, uh, you can't see very well because the text is very small, but when we talk about these realms of the various heavens and hells, these are distributed vertically along this axis of Mount Sumeru. So some of them are going down into the various mandala that formed the Earth at the top, and then some of them are, are up following Mount Sumeru off above. So this process of the physical world forming then leads to the forming of what we refer to in Buddhism as the, the formless realm, the form realm, and the desire realms. And the desire realms extend up to um, the, you can see there's kind of like a netting sort of thing that's on, on Sumeru in this picture. And that netting is where the planets are, are moving around the Earth, which is this disk. So the form, formless, and desire realms are spread vertically, and human beings are in the desire realms as well as the lower gods. And then above that, there's the realm of form. And in the realm of form, everybody has bodies that are made of light, and they don't subsist on food. And then above that, there's the formless realm. And this is where the highest heavenly beings are. And the Buddha travels there in various sutra through <coughs> meditative practices. That's one of the purposes of meditative concentration, is to be able to move along this axis for various purposes. And so the formless realm is where like, some of the Indian deities like Brahma and, and people like this are, where they're not necessarily corporeal. They can emanate themselves corporeally, but they don't have bodies or things like that, like we think of. So. These people didn't all come into being at the same time. According to at least one of the accounts, first we had these beings who existed in the realm of form, and they had these bodies that were made of light. And they went down and thought they would be interested in checking out what the Earth was like. So they went down there and they started eating parts of the Earth, right? I mean, that's what we do. So they started eating parts of the Earth, and one of them did this originally. And he said, wow, you know, this is really tasty. But the thing is, he couldn't stop doing it. He just kept eating more and more because it was so good, and he'd never tasted anything like it. And a lot of the other people who were sort of there in the, in the form realm looking at this, who had light bodies as well, they're kind of looking and they say, wow, this is really enjoyable, and they see how much he's into it. And so they go down there themselves and start eating as well. And the result of this is that instead of having bodies that are made of light, their bodies start to be made of the earth, right? And the other elements, because they're eating these elements. Well, it so happens that before human being or before beings came to Earth, there was no sun, there was no moon, there were no stars, there was no gender or sexual distinction, etc. Because everybody's bodies were made of light. But when they start eating the stuff from the Earth, first they have this experience of desire and greed, right? They want to keep eating and eating and eating. And then they start to form sexual differences, and this leads to them beginning to explore sexuality, which then leads to all of the sort of problems that you might imagine with this, people cheating, all this kinds of stuff, which gets a lot of people upset. And so basically, you keep adding on as people spend more time on Earth, and things get worse and worse, because they have all these issues they didn't have when they were light-bodied heavenly beings. So the end of this is, it plunges the world into darkness. But because things arise dependently, this is actually what causes the emergence of the sun and moon. And the emergence of the sun and moon are what start time as we understand it now, where we have days and nights, months, years, etc. But this also means that now we have 
what are called the four eras, which these also exist um, in in other in other Indian religions, like um, like Hinduism, for instance. So the four eras are the Krita Yuga, which is the era of perfect precepts. And this is before everybody started eating the earth. They didn't experience desire, and everybody behaved very ethically toward each other. There wasn't really any need for strife. And then the second period is the Treta Yuga, which is the era of keeping three precepts. At this point, people had only done, like, one bad thing as a group. But then we get into the Dvapara Yuga, which is the era of keeping two precepts. You can imagine this is the slippery slope. And then we have the Kali Yuga which is the one most people are probably familiar with, which is supposed to be the era of conflict. And interestingly enough, in the Kali Yuga, supposedly everybody is doing all kinds of terrible things all the time. And on top of that, as a result, the lifespan of human beings shrinks down to roughly 100 years. Uh, so very briefly, I was going to spend more time on the other version of this that's more influential in Tibet, because they spend a decent amount of time in, in this particular book on it. But the main difference is that below that first disk of wind, you have a disk that's, that's empty space, and there are empty particles of some sort. Not particles in the sense that we think of, but extremely small units of some form of matter-like thing. And those, those empty particles, as they translate it, are what contains all of the sort all of the other elements. So in other words, that emptiness is there first. And in this case, it's pretty much the same uh, same development, except that there's additionally a disk of fire in the mandala that form the world. And this is sort of where electricity is seen to come from, is the mixing of the fire and air mandala. So you probably want to know how the world ends. <laughs> Well, there are two very different versions, and I actually had a very hard time trying to make the numbers add up on this one. <laughs> so please bear with me on that. But the basic idea is that there are a series of cycles of destruction by the various elements that formed the world in the first place. So in some of the accounting, there are seven cycles of fire and then a cycle of water uh, there are seven cycles of water, seven more cycles of fire, and then finally wind is what destroys the world completely. Of course, there are other worlds all over the place. This isn't the end of the universe or anything like that. It's just the end of, you know, a world. And then, of course, the process starts over again when it's done, because these particles are still here, right? So they'll start another, start another cycle because of the actions of sentient beings that they took while these things were going on. So according to, um, I think it's Vasubandhu, there are, no, it's a Sangha, I apologize. Uh, he says that this totals up to 58 cycles, and that's where I got very confused, because I don't exactly understand how the math works out on this, so we must have like epicycles of some of these things happening uh, in a different pattern than just listing them out like this, but that's from an Abhidharma text when they're listed out this way. So the competing model to this, the sort of Kala Chakra understanding of it, where we had emptiness particles as well, um, it's a little bit different. So the idea is that the destruction of the world is just first all of these different types of elemental particles just start to separate. They no longer coalesce. And this is brought about by things like water, fire, etc. And so when you think about those disks, Essentially, the first disk starts to dissolve and spread, and it goes down into the next one, is reclaimed by it. This one starts to separate, goes down into the next, etc., until they totally contract down to these empty particles that they had mentioned in the first place. So you can sort of imagine that these, that these particles are moving around, and the whole thing kind of expands up into the state of the present world system with Meru and all the heavens and all of these things and all of the hells beneath and then sort of contracts back down to emptiness, and it's sort of following this pattern throughout time. Now, there were calculations about how long exactly all of this took, but I'm not even going to go there. 
How many kalpas? Well, and that's another thing, is that kalpas are different depending on whose book you're reading. <laughs> which is a common problem. But I did want to spend a little bit of time on Aryabhata because I think he presents sort of an interesting counterpoint. This book seems to almost imply that he was Buddhist, but I'm not sure that he necessarily was. So he was an astronomer and a mathematician who was very influential. Uh, he lived from 476 to 550 CE, and he was presumably at Nalanda, but it's actually not sure that that was the case. He was associated with a prominent university in the same city as Nalanda, but it was not named specifically as Nalanda. So many people do believe that he was actually teaching at Nalanda, but we're not sure. This is actually a statue of him outside of an Indian university's uh, astronomy and astrophysics building. Um, mm. He was extremely influential, uh, more in the Arab world than in the Indian world, interestingly enough. So he was most influential, actually, because a lot of uh, well, the works of his that remained were actually translated into Arabic. And uh, people who were very famous uh, Arab mathematicians and astronomers were actually consulting his work as sort of a basis that they used to develop their own, their own treatises. So if you don't like algebra, you have him to thank, because <laughs> Al-Kharizmi, uh, who's the person that algorithms are named after, uh, actually um, he translated Aryabhata's works and also cited them in his own works. Um, but I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about uh, <laughs> some of the things that Aryabhata did accomplish. So he's also credited with um, the definitions of your favorite trig functions, sine, cosine, and the inverse sine. And he didn't exactly form them in the way that we understand modern trigonometry. But he did form basically equivalents, and in his one of his main works on astronomy, he actually has a table of the signs of various angles, so that you can just readily look them up. Interestingly enough, um, he used a Sanskrit term that was transliterated into Arabic. In Arabic, it didn't necessarily mean anything because it was a transliteration. So uh, later scholars were translating these works from the Arab world into Latin, right? And when they did, they tried to come up with something that made sense with a mistranslation of what was actually a transliteration in the first place, which is where they came up with the word for a fold in a garment or a curve, etc., which is actually uh, sinus, uh, like sinus, and that's where we get sign from. So we actually sort of owe Aryabhata for even having that terminology in the first place, even though it's by way of mistranslation. Fun fact. But... These aren't the end of his accomplishments. Uh, he also was doing a lot of other interesting things. Just looking at different encyclopedia entries on him, I found out that uh, he was credited as um, having a place value system in his mathematical text, despite not using zero. So he basically used zero functionally without ever using the symbol, because he relied on using the system that had been used in Vedic texts of representing uh, all of the numbers with letters in the alphabet. So, despite this, he uh, was able to approximate pi as 3.1416, despite not having decimals. Um, he didn't get to that answer. He uses much bigger numbers to make it reduce correctly. Uh, he also developed an algorithm for solving uh, linear Diophantine equations, which if you don't know what those are, save yourself the headache and don't learn. <laughs> Um, he also provided methods that were used for calculating the summations of a series of cubes and squares as well, uh, like numbers to the second power, numbers to the third power, like large series of those. Um, he also, uh, in the realm of astronomy, was able to explain eclipses correctly, which uh, he's one of the first people to do, at least in India, by explaining them in terms of the, the shadows of bodies moving in, in space. Uh, as well as making some impressive calculations, like calculating the rotation of the Earth at 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.1 seconds, which is very close to what we have in the present, uh, as well as the length of a year at 365.25858 days, which is, he was off by essentially 3 minutes and 20 seconds from the number that we use now. <laughs> 
So in other words, he was immensely in influential, and he also had a satellite named after him, which was the first satellite launched by India. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, on the two rupee note, I think. There's a picture of it. <laughs> And uh, another lasting influence is that all these astronomical calculations that he was doing uh, are still used to this day in various calendrical systems. So the Hindu calendar is actually corrected using some of his uh, calculations, as well as the calendars that are presently used in Iran and Afghanistan are modified versions of his calendrical system. So just a few reflections on, on the discussion this evening. So I picked this because I thought it was kind of a fun topic. Um, it's not necessarily super instructional, but I feel compelled to try and drag some lessons out of it. <laughs> so one of them that I think is a point that we should keep thinking about is that Buddhism sort of has this reputation of being a scientific religion. And if you just listen to that whole account of things, I think you would be a stretch. Tributes to Arabata. Yeah, Aryabhata, I would say, is like, that's proto-scientific, but like, but yeah, the, the sort of accounts from the Abhidharma and the Kala Chakra systems had predictive power and were useful symbolically, but we would be hard-pressed to say that this was something in terms of like a modern science, right? This isn't coming from measurements with instruments, the scientific method, experimentation, etc. But I think one of the things that's sort of interesting about Buddhism is that because Shakyamuni Buddha refused to speculate about these issues, he actually set people up pretty well for the future. Because in that case, Buddhism doesn't have any huge doctrinal uh, issues with accepting discoveries of, of modern science. So in other words, it's not really going to interfere with the major narrative but it might cause us to call into question things like, you know, exegetical texts that are part of the Abhidharma or like sort of some of these more scholarly treatises where they were trying to estimate how these things worked. But all in all, it's not necessarily a huge loss that we have more knowledge about it from other means that we can also supplement. Now, the other side of this is that I think Buddhist cosmology is interesting in that it's a metaphor that's used throughout Buddhist Sutra. So even if we don't take it as a literal explanation for things, it's used often as a way of sort of framing where the Buddha and ourselves are situated within the various types of beings that exist in this pantheon. But it's also sort of about the qualities of us, right? So it can be used as a way to explore what it means for us to be human beings and, and what the difference might be between somebody who is a human being versus, uh, you know, this idea of a perfected bodhisattva or something like this as well. But we can also sort of use these things to symbolize our experience, and that's one of the ways I think they're really useful. Um, our tendency is to try and make meaning out of things, to understand things. And one of the issues that we have is we live in a world and a universe that are pretty hard for us to wrap our minds around just because of the sheer scale and complexity of them. Now, I'm not saying that that means that we should just say, okay, well, the Abhidharma model is much less confusing. And so I'm just going to adopt that, and that's now my view of how everything works. But I think it is worth noting that there was kind of an assumption that if everything comes from dependent origination, then the things that we experience as a single human being, even down to like the most minute particles that we're speculating about, all the way up to the various bodies that exist in, in space, all the world systems, all of these things, that they sort of follow the same set of rules. And so in that sense, some of these stories are really helpful for being able to understand sort of foundational Buddhist ideas versus the sometimes kind of abstract way that they might be presented. It just gives you one more example that you can look at. You can remember the story. It's almost like a mnemonic. And then the one last lesson that I kind of wanted to pull out of this is that in many Buddhist texts, we see this interesting phrase about one of the powers that the bodhisattvas and the Buddhas have is the ability to know the minds of other beings. And this is one of the things that makes them so powerful, right? This is why bodhisattvas are able to save sentient beings, because they're able to understand the minds of other beings. This is the same with the Buddha. This is why he used various methods to teach and instruct throughout his career, because he understood exactly what people needed to know. But we can take that as meaning, you know, something like, uh, idea of omniscience, where it's we're reading minds with telepathy or something like that. 
But if one of the other ways that's kind of interesting to think about this idea is scholarship as a Buddhist practice of looking at things like, for instance, trying to understand what this worldview might have looked like for people who were not contemporaries of the Buddha. They're coming, you know, roughly a thousand years later. But it's interesting to try and look at those things and put ourselves into their shoes and try and understand the Buddhist teachings the way that they did. And I think there's, you know, we're talking about some people who are really the heavy hitters of Buddhist exegesis who were subscribing to some of these views. And so it's very much integrated in their understanding of doctrine at a larger level. So from that perspective, I actually think that it's kind of fun to pick some of these topics that might not be as pragmatic because in another sense, I think they teach us a valuable skill, which is the ability to really try and understand other people whose ideas are very different than ours on, on their own terms to let them tell us the story and then try and sort of understand how that's different from what we already think, but to try and evaluate it on its own merits and see where it's useful and maybe where it's, where it's not beneficial, depending on the situation. So with that, I'm going to open it up for <laughs> questions, comments, and thoughts. And it took me a while to find an animal that went to space that didn't die a horrible death. So I picked <laughs> one that this, this guy is Ham, and he actually was trained to be able to operate controls on the spacecraft he was on. They trained him with bananas and colored lights. <laughs> so he was pulling the switches. He was in the driver's seat. Which indicates that any of us can go to space. <laughs> I'll be there next. <laughs> so uh, before we stop the recording, I just wanted to ask um, if Ichishima Sensei, if you have anything that you wanted to add. Oh, thank you. Well, it reminds me uh, about my junior high school days. I discovered, I found that uh, uh, baby goose uh, can drink milk out of water. It is very interesting. And then when I studied uh, Yomachara uh, uh, at university, very interesting point by Asanga uh, in his uh, Mahayana Sangraha, I think uh, this is the summary of the great vehicle. It says that the non appearance of illusion and the appearance of reality are the Bodhisattva's conversion of support liberation functioning at will. So uh, like this, you know, I think uh, uh, Asanga, when he tried to visit his brother uh, Basbandu, uh, he really encountered uh, such baby goose drinks milk out of water. It is quite, this is the beginning of, I think, uh, Vijnana Bada. Uh, that that is my impression. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so very much. Thank you. And uh, Sensei, if you had anything that you wanted to add, no, I, I I don't really have anything to add. This is an area that I've never really looked yeah. at, so I find it really fascinating to just um, uh, hear your explanation of it. I mean, I you know knew the the, the tale of Mount Simaru, but I didn't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's really interesting. And when I um, think about the people who were looking at the world around them at that time, meaning a thousand, fifteen hundred years ago, whatever that, that may have been. Um, their world was so different than ours. It was something that I was, I was just reading the other day, totally unrelated to this, just reminding us that today what we think we know we have to remember what we've lost. You know, just a couple of hundred years ago, all of us would have known all the plant, all the plants around us. We would have been able to tell you when the sun was going to rise, when the sun was going to set. They would know that automatically. Now I have to look at an app to tell me, right? We know when the moon, what phase the moon is going to be in. So their world was filled with experiencing it in real time now. And we've lost that ability in some ways. And so when I when I looked at um, Aryabhata as an example, there's an individual who was really curious about why things were happening the way they were and what they were, just 
empirically, you know, how do I how do I do this? And I'm not sure that, that many of us could do that now. We we have to go to the university and study for an inordinate amount of time to to be able to pursue something along those lines of getting it out of a book instead of experiencing it. And it just it I find that really impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.